Good evening and welcome to Peace IT's webinar this evening. And tonight we will be talking about CompTIA's A plus exam 220-801. I will be covering objectives 1.11 1 and 1.12 this evening. I am Brian Farrell. I am the course instructor for CIS 205 for Edmonds Community College, and I am the certificate mentor for the Technology and Integration Support Program of PACE IT. Here are a few of my qualifications and certifications. And with that, let's go ahead and start talking about tonight's topics. Again, I'm going to be taking tonight's topics from CompTIA's A plus exam 220-801, objectives 1.11 and 1.12. And what are those exam objectives? Well, objective 1.11 is cables and connections, and 1.12 has to deal with peripheral devices. And with that, let's go ahead and jump into the first topic, which is cables and connections. So the first thing that we get to talk about are internal cables and connections. And the first internal connection and cable we get to talk about is the floppy disk drive connection. Now, most motherboards nowadays do not come with these, but you might still come across it, so we get to talk about it. The floppy disk drive cable was a 34-wire connector, and it had 34 pins. Up to two floppy drives could be connected per cable. With the higher priority, or the A status, going to the floppy drive that was connected after the twist in the wire, or the twist in the cable. You can see from that graphic right where that red arrow is pointing, that is the twist that I'm talking about. The next connector down would be for the other floppy drive if you had more than one, and that would become your B drive. By the way, even today, modern systems default to the first hard drive being the C drive, and that's a holdover from the floppy disk drive days. Well, the next one that we get to talk about is the PADA, the Parallel AT Attachment. You could also call that the Parallel Advanced Technology Attachment Cable. PADA had two basic standards. Uh, the first standard was the Integrated Drive Electronics standard, the IDE standard, and the other version was the Enhanced Integrated Drive Electronics, the EIDE. Now, they both used the same type of connector on their ends, which was 40 pins, and the IDE cable had 40 wires to go with those 40 pins. And up to two PADA devices could be on a single cable. The priority or the master setting was determined by jumpers, with the other, your other choice being the slave setting, which means it was subordinate and would have the higher drive letter. So the master PADA device would be the C drive, usually as it was a hard drive, and your D drive would be like an optical drive, and it would be the slave. Or your D drive could have been an additional hard drive. Well, IDE wasn't quite fast enough, so, along, so they developed EIDE. Like I said earlier, it had the same 40-pin connectors on the ends of it, but the EIDE cable had 80 wires. That allowed for higher throughput of data. Um, EIDE and IDE cables could be a maximum of 18 inches long. Not that big of a deal, not that long, but then again, the inside of your case isn't that big, so the 18 inches work just fine. 
it is, and it is becoming harder and harder nowadays to find actually find a modern motherboard that can came comes with a PATA connection to it. Why is that? Well, that's because the serial AT attachment or SATA uh, connection is actually a whole lot faster and more robust. Now, the SATA cable contains a 7-wire, seven 7-pin seven connection. Unlike uh, PATA and the floppy drive connections or cables, you can only connect one SATA device to a SATA cable. And your priority is no longer set on the by jumpers on the drive, but it's set in BIOS, in the basic input-output system. If you notice the end of those connectors, they're L-shaped. That keeps you from inserting the cables the wrong way. Uh, it comes in handy, makes it real easy. You don't really even need to look at the connection to, to fit it in there because if it if it's going to work, it'll snap right in place. And if it doesn't, turn it over. Try it again. Uh, on a side note, one of the things that we got with SATA, all SATA devices are hot swappable. That means that you don't need to shut the system down to replace, say, a bad hard drive. You can just unplug it from the SATA connection and plug a new one in. The operating system will recognize it. It'll come right up, not a problem. And that works great until you consider the fact that if it's on the inside of your computer case, it does not do you a whole lot of good for it to be hot swappable. Now that we're done with the inside of the case, we're going to move to the outside of the case. And we begin with the serial connector and connections. Uh, the most common connection was a nine pin connection that you see pictured there. That nine pin connection could be called a DV9 or it could be called an RS232 connector, which is from the RS232 communication standard. And that is a D subminiature nine pin connector. Again, this is a little bit older technology. Most computers don't come with a serial connector anymore. And the same thing could be said about the parallel connector connection. Uh, the most common cable and connection is the 25 pin connector. That is called a DB25 or a D subminiature 25 pin connector. They get their name, by the way. The D is the D series of connector, or actually the shape of the connector. Uh, and it's a sub-miniature because it's a small version, yada, yada, yada. Um, next up is the PS2, or the Personal System 2 connection, also known as the Mini Bin 6. These were most commonly used for keyboards and mice. And in most cases, <coughs> the other end of the the wire was actually hardwired into the keyboard or mouse. They were round in shape. And just like the other two, getting harder and harder to find a system that comes with those. Why is that? Because we've come up with better things to connect with. Then we can have SCSI. That is the SC. SI, the Small Computer System Interface. Now, this is a standard that has evolved over time. And the SCSI is a standard that involves how peripheral devices communicate with the computer. And it's had a whole bunch of different cables and connections. Most SCSI cables were the most common cable used in SCSI was a ribbon cable with two or more connectors on them. When you're talking about the SCSI bus, if it was a narrow SCSI, you could have 
let's see, you could have eight total devices, including the controller. That means you would have a controller and seven devices could be connected to the SCSI bus. If it was the wide version of SCSI, well, you could have 16, including the controller, which actually means one controller and 15 devices. The most common SCSI connectors are the 68 pin, the 50 pin, and the 25 pin. And I'm not going to talk about these very much, but you do need to know a, that the 68, 50, and 25 pin were the most common, and you do need to know uh, about narrow and wide, but you can watch one of my other webinars to get more information on that. Then, the, then we have connections for sound. Uh, and the most common connection for sound involves the TRS, the tip ring sleeve connector, which I have pictured there. With these dues, you plug them into the back of your PC, and they go to either your input, if it's a mic, or your output, if it's a speaker. And it carries analog signal. It carries an analog signal. So the signal that you have coming out of your computer going to your speakers is analog if you're using a TRS connector. But of course, you could be using as a Sony Philips Digital Interconnect format, the SPDIF, or the, yeah, the SPDIF. I did not picture one of those. It has come in several different iterations. Now, the SPDIF is actually a digital carrier. So if you're using that, you're actually getting digital sound. Next up, we have our network connectors. The most, there are two common network connectors. Most people don't really think of both of them as being network connections, but they are. And the first one is the RJ45, the registered, registered Jack 45. This is the one that most people are familiar with. It is your standard cable for connecting to an Ethernet network, which just happens to be the most popular type of network that there is, at least what we like to think of as a network. Now, the RJ45 uses an 8-pin modular connector with up to 8 wires being used as conductors. That means up to 8 wires carrying a signal. So technically, that is an 8P8C connector, and it's used to transmit data, both to and transmit data from a computer and used to receive data into the computer. <coughs> Excuse me. The other most common type of network connector is the RJ11, the registered Jack 11. Now, most people don't think about this as being a network connection, but it is. It's the connector that's used for telephones, and it carries an analog signal. Now, what we commonly refer to as an RJ11 doesn't truly match the definition of an RJ11. Why is that? Well, because what we call an RJ11 actually has six pins and uses up to four wires as conductors. It's a modular 6P4C connector. A true RJ11 is actually a four pin, a 4P, uh, 2C, two wire connector. That worked great in the old days in the beginning of telephony, but it didn't quite handle the load. So they came up with the 6P4C connector, and everybody was so used to the RJ11 that the name stuck. They are physically the same size, but they are not the same thing. But you can still call that thing an RJ11. Kind of confusing, I know, but hey, that's IT for you. Another type of network connection that you can have is with coaxial cabling. The only place that you'll really see this in the modern small office, home office network anymore is if they're taking their internet connection through the cable system. We don't really use 
cable on uh, local area networks anymore. Well, yeah, not really on on your standard local area networks. You will be, you will or can see uh, coax being used on some high speed local area networks, some larger ones. But I won't get into that one right now. Uh, actually, I will mention a little bit about it. They are quite often used on the backbone side because they can handle a whole lot more bandwidth than your twisted, your standard twisted pair cabling can. But if you don't need that super high amount of bandwidth, you won't see coax in your networks. Now that we're done with that, let's move on to some other standards. And the first one we're going to talk about is the USB connection and cable. And first up is USB versions 1 and its different iterations and USB version 2. Now these use the same cable and connectors and your connection is used, excuse me, either four or five pins. And there were two broad categories of connectors. There was the type A connector and the type B connector. The main difference is, is that the type A USB connector can carry power to the peripheral device as well as carrying data to and from. Well, the type B connector could not or does not provide power to peripherals. There's a graphic of type A and type B USB connectors. Now your maximum length of a USB cable is 5 meters, so roughly 15 feet or 18 feet. I'm trying to remember my metric conversions and I'm not doing a very good job. Well, USB 1 and 2 were fairly fast, but they weren't quite fast enough for what we expect nowadays, so along came USB 3. Now USB 3 is a higher speed version of USB. You can plug a USB type uh, 1 and type 2 device into a USB 3 port. It will work just fine, but you cannot plug a USB 3 device into a USB 1 or 2 cable. It just won't work. The cable ends are actually different on the peripheral side, on the device side, as opposed to the computer side. I didn't get a picture of one of those. Sorry about that. Uh, if you're looking at a computer and you want to know if that USB slot is uh, version 3 slot, you look at the little metal, little metal, little plastic tab on the inside of the slot. If it's colored blue, it's USB 3. If it's black or gray, it's either version 1 or version 2. Uh, USB, USB 3.0 does not have a maximum cable length. The only thing they say about the cable length is that it has to meet the electrical specifications. They don't care how long it is, unlike with the other versions, it just has to be able to carry the right amount of current in the correct format for it to be a uh, good cable. Now that we're done with USB, let's talk about the IEEE 1394, also known as FireWire. Now, FireWire was developed by Apple, and originally it was proprietary to Apple, and then they released it as an open standard, which the IEEE took over and, and gave it their own number, which is, like I said, the IEEE 1394. There are two current standards, at least two current standards that you need to know about, although there are some other standards out there, and that would be FireWire 400 and FireWire 800. FireWire 400 uses a six conductor cable, and it has a maximum length of 4.5 meters. The FireWire 800 has a nine pin connector. It's shaped differently. As you can see there from the pictures, it's more rectangle. 
and it too has a maximum length of 4.5 meters. You know, the two are not interchangeable because of their different connections, but they are actually supposed to be backwards compatible. Then we have the external SATA, the eSATA interface, cable and connection. Now, this is a standard that brings the SATA speeds to the outside of the PC. Why do we want to do that? Well, because theoretically with SATA 3.0, you get 6 gigabits per second in transfer rate, which is currently faster than anything else out there. So they thought SATA should go on the outside of the case as well on, on the inside of the case. Now, if you have an eSATA port, it is a combination port. It combines USB with a SATA port. So you can connect an eSATA device to that port, or you can connect a USB device, as long as it's not USB 3.0, to that port. The only problem is, is that that eSATA port has not been approved by the organization that sets the USB standards, and it hasn't been approved by the organization that sets the SATA standards. So maybe it'll work for you, maybe it won't. Um, kind of a use at your own risk because the two organizations that set the standards that we're talking about don't recognize it as being a valid port, even though many of them have it, including my laptop. So moving on, we go to uh, ways to connect to uh, display devices, and we're going to start with analog. I titled this analog displays, even though it doesn't necessarily have to con uh, um, connect to an analog display. We're just talking about analog signal connections. And the first one that we're going to talk about is the composite or RCA cable kind of looks like a TRS cable that you use for sound, but it is different. It carries an analog, a compressed analog video stream from your PC to your display. If you're using a composite type connection to your display, you're actually getting the lowest possible resolution that you can have uh, on your video display. The next one up would be the S-Video cable. It is a four-pin cable. It has slightly better resolution than a composite cable. It's round. That's that one that's in the upper right-hand corner there of the graphic. And it, too, carries an analog signal. Then you have the component, also known as the RGB cable. And this is actually a combination of three cables. It breaks the color components of the video stream into three discrete separate channels. It actually has pretty good resolution. It has much better resolution than an S-Video. I've actually never seen one of those on a computer monitor display, but hey, I haven't seen every display. The one that's probably most uh, recognizable to everyone would be the VGA. Uh, connection. That's that one there in the lower right hand corner that has 15 pins. That is called a VGA connection, Video Graphics Array Connection. It could also be called a DB15 for a D sub miniature 15 pin plug or an HD15 for high density 15. Now this is also an analog display standard. But it also happens to offer the best video resolution out of the analog connections that we're talking about here. So let's move on to digital. And we get to talk about DVI, the dig digital visual interface first. Now this is designed to carry an uncompressed digital video stream from your PC to your monitor. It offers, <clears throat> excuse me, it offers much better re resolution if you're doing it in digital, by the way. 
than any of the analog methods of connecting. And why did I put that caveat in there? You know, if you're carrying it in uh, digital, well, because there are three separate DVI connections. There's the DVI A, and the A stands for analog, and it can only carry an analog stream. So it takes that connection on the back of your computer actually receives the digital video image from the processor and converts it into an analog signal and sends it along the wire in an analog format to your display. Never quite figured that one out, but hey, again, I don't know everything. I haven't seen everything. Then there is the DVI-D, and the D stands for digital, and this one can only carry a digital stream. Then there's the DVI-I, which stands for integrated, and now this plug can carry both, well, both, either an analog or a digital video stream, depending upon what type of display you have. Then there's HDMI, the High Definition Multimedia Interface. Now, this is designed to carry uncompressed digital video and sound or audio across the same cat or across the same cable. And it provides for extremely high transfer rate and extremely high quality uh, it is one of the better connections that you can have. Now, HDMI did come in two standards. There is the HDMI, which we have been kind of talking about, and that's the full size, and it has 19 pins. Then there is the mini HDMI. It's actually a smaller connector, but guess what? It still has 19 pins. And it's not as robust as the full-size HDMI. That means you're much more likely to break a mini HDMI connection, I mean physically break it, than you will the standard size HDMI. And then finally, we have the DisplayPort. Now, DisplayPort, again, was a standard developed by Apple. Uh, thankfully, they released it to uh, open source, which is actually great for most of us. And it's used for transmitting high-quality video from a device to a display. It uses a 20-pin connection, and it also comes in various sizes depending upon the form factor of the device that you're connecting to. They're actually putting uh, some some display ports, some of the mini, teeny tiny ones, on tablets so that you can output to from your tablet to a projector. Those are the connections and cables that uh, CompTIA thinks you need to know about. Most of them are pretty easy to recognize. The only one that's really going to give you any trouble looking at it visually and telling the difference is telling the difference between an EIDE cable and an IDE cable. What I have pictured here is actually an EIDE cable. I can tell because I've seen enough of them. But if you're just new to this, you may have difficulty being able to tell a 40-wire cable from an 80-wire cable. Uh, if you get a chance to practice, and I'm not sure how you practice looking at them, uh, but if you get a chance to look at them side by side, uh, pay close attention so that you too can tell the difference. And just remember that EIDE is the better standard uh, can carry more data. So with that, let's go ahead and move on to peripheral devices. Which is uh, objective 1.12 of the 220-801 exam. 
So there we go. So what are peripheral devices? Well, peripheral devices are not built into the PC. They are external to the computer. They do have a connection to the computer. That connection be, can be either through a wired connection or through a wireless connection. Peripheral devices have a main purpose. That main purpose can be to improve input. It can be to improve output. It can be to extend functionality or increase productivity and or it can be to expand enjoyment. All peripheral devices use device drivers. The device driver tells the host operating system how the peripheral device is supposed to interact with the system. It tells the operating system how that device is connected to it. Uh, the driver will also tell the operating system how peripheral devices are supposed to operate together. One of the things about device drivers is that the system that system, the manufacturer of the peripheral is the one who is responsible for developing and providing the device driver. Although Windows operating system has a lot of built-in drivers to them, to it, uh, it's still the peripheral manufacturer's responsibility to ensure that you have the proper driver. It's not the operating system supplier's job to do it. You need to be aware of that because sometimes you come into problems with them. So how do we make the connection from a peripheral device to the PC? Well, let's start with uh, some of our old friends, the legacy connections. There's the serial port, which are the ones down there on the bottom, those nine pin connectors, the DB9s. Uh, you could also use a parallel port or a parallel connection. That's that kind of pinkish purplish one up above, the 25 pin DB25. Uh, the most common device that was connected to the DB25 was either a printer or a scanner. In the beginning, the most common device that was plugged into a serial port was a mouse. Then there were the PS2 or the Mini DIN 6, which was for keyboard and mice. And all of these are kind of legacy connections. You're a little bit, you'd be a little bit hard pressed to buy a system nowadays that have those. So what other kind of connections can you use? Well, you can use SCSI. We talked about that earlier. Uh, SCSI allows you to daisy chain devices together. You can either have seven devices in a controller or 15 devices in a controller. That was pretty good back in the day. But, you know what, USB came along. USB, by the way, is a whole lot faster than the SCSI interface, which actually used to be the fastest interface. And not only that, but you can daisy chain 128 devices on a USB connection, kind of. Uh, I say you can do 128 devices, but one of those devices is the controller, is the USB controller. So you can actually daisy chain 127 peripherals to a single USB port. That is a lot of devices. I've never known anybody to do that, but I'm sure somebody did it somewhere. The USB connection is the most popular connection for peripheral devices today. You could use the IEEE 1394 or FireWire connection. You could make a connection wirelessly via Bluetooth and create your own personal area network or PAN. Or you can connect a peripheral device wireless, wirelessly to your computer via the wireless standards 802.11. 
we will be talking about more of those in future webinars. And you can also make a connection with a peripheral device to your PC through a network connection, through the e either through the network or actually directly connected with an Ethernet cable to your PC. You can also use a TRS connection. Remember all of those connections that we talked about earlier? Here's where they come into play. So some manufacturers of peripheral devices may require a proprietary connection. So if you buy a device and it has a proprietary connection, guess what? You also need to go back to that manufacturer to get the means of connecting it to your PC. Sometimes what they do in order to keep um, you from making your own device is that they will design the driver for that device to read pins a little bit differently. And then they will require you to use what's called a dongle to make a uh, connection to a standard port, only the dongle is wired a little bit differently so that it can receive the transmission. If you have a question about that, you might want to ask me after the webinar, and I'll try and explain it a little bit better. So let's talk about connecting peripheral devices to your computer. So one of the first things that you need to do when you're going to connect a peripheral device to a computer is read the manufacturer's installation instructions first. Why is that? Well, because in some cases it is of major importance that you install the device driver at the right time. As a general rule, if you can, I would recommend always installing the di device driver first and then plugging the device, the peripheral device, into the PC. Sometimes if you plug the peripheral device into the PC first, particularly if you're using a Windows operating system, and Windows happens to think that it has the correct device driver, it will use that device driver even if you use the manufacturer's, try and use the manufacturer's device driver later. That can result in some loss of functionality and some frustration as you try and convince the Windows operating system not to use its built-in driver, but that you want to use the manufacturer's. So what kind of peripheral devices are there? Well, there are input devices. And these are just some examples of peripheral devices. There are mice and, key <coughs> and keyboards, excuse me, which commonly nowadays use, if they're wired, they will use a USB connection. And if they are wireless, they will use Bluetooth. Then you have the KVM. This is actually a keyboard video and I put monitor, that's actually mouse switch. Sorry about that. Uh, and in this situation, this is where you have one keyboard and one mouse, one monitor, but two computers, and you want to use, alternate using those computers. You use a KVM switch to transfer the input from your devices from PC to PC. There are biometric devices like fingerprint scanners or retinal scanners anymore. There are game pads and joysticks. Microphones are an input device. There are digitizers, and those are for capturing an analog signal in a digital format. Then we have output devices like printers, speakers, or display devices. And finally, we have multimedia devices like digital cameras, camcorders, webcams, and the MIDI, the Musical Instrument Digital Interface. Now, the MIDI is used for um, two things, usually. The MIDI will take input from a musical instrument 
and store it digitally on a PC, actually convert it to a digital signal on the PC so that you can modify it. A lot of MIDI's also have output capabilities, so you can take a digital sound from the PC and actually load it into a musical instrument that has a MIDI connection. Most often, those were keyboards. Now, that concludes my presentation of this information on tonight's webinar. We covered uh, exam topics from CompTIA's 220-802 exam, and we covered objectives 1.11 and 1.12. Now, on behalf of Pace IT, thank you for watching this session.